So my name is Daniel Hinschliff and I um, used to work at the BAM uh, in, in Germany. Some of you will know me from uh, that process accompanying the Ecodesign Directive. I now work at the GIZ on uh, electronic waste management in developing countries. So uh, this is uh, uh, the result of some, some assessment that we did um, at the end of my, my time at the BAM and this then became a, a paper last year. Um, but I'm not necessarily representing uh, either of these institutions in, in this uh, presentation. Um, so, starting again with the Eco Design and Energy Labeling Directors, I, th I think everybody know, knows uh, how those work. Um, we have uh, the performance standard from Eco Design setting minimum uh, limits for products in the EU, and also information requirements coming from Eco Design and uh, Energy Labels. And all of these um, products are very much dependent on um, an accompanying regulatory process, which can take quite a, a long time. As we heard yesterday, it's it's becoming rather slow. Um, and what's crucial to these uh, requirements is the preparatory study. And um, for those less familiar with, with this uh, process, I'm sure many of you have been at stakeholder meetings or uh, consultation forums, uh, or also making these studies. Um, it's a, a, a format which is a standardized method methodology for making new eco-design regulations. And uh, it's normally carried out by external consultants over about two years, and you have two to three stakeholder meetings. And the aim is really to, to make a market assessment, um, to identify your scope and definitions for different products, um, look at the usage behavior uh, in real terms, different technologies that are on the market. And once you have all of that information, you can start to make your base cases, which is sort of average products, and then also do a life cycle analysis and at least uh, cost uh, analysis, uh, least, least life cycle cost analysis on these products to set your eco design regulation. So once you've done that, you can then look at different design options, see what the environmental impact would be, and make your policy scenarios. And um, so the short term of this is the MIRP, um, and this is used in all eco design regulations. We have now, I think, about 29 eco design regulations in force and about 15 labels. And the majority of these have followed this methodology, which is known to stakeholders. And because it's a standardized methodology, it's quite useful to be able to compare between different product groups. And needless to say, if you have a, a good preparatory study following this methodology with good data and um, good stakeholder input, you can actually really make good legislation and get consensus in, in the regulatory process. So the regulatory process is quite long. Um, on average to 2012, it took 49 months to get uh, a legislation from kind of identifying it in the working plan all the way through to uh, being uh, agreed upon uh, and published in the European Journal of, uh, the European Commission Journal uh, as a, as a uh, uh, regulation. And um, what I want to focus on today is, yeah, the preparatory study, which is um, for new products and the consultation forum, so that's points two and, and four in this diagram. Uh, once um, a preparatory study is done, um, the Commission develops some regulation proposals, and these are then brought to the consultation forum, discussed with, with stakeholders from industry and uh, member states, and based on that, there will then be more discussions, the regulatory proposals will be adjusted, and you then move into impact assessments, and further steps such as uh, inter-service uh, consultation within the, the Commission until you get to the regulation. So once these regulations are in force, um, they also have a review clause, uh, normally in Article 7, which says after um, a certain number of years, you also have to review your regulation. And that's normally dependent on the rate of technological change in your product group, or um, maybe there's some specific aspects which couldn't really be addressed in the preparatory study. And they will also be listed in this review clause. And um, if you have a fast-changing product group like televisions, you might say, OK, we, we can review that in three years' time because there's so much change in the market. Things which are very established products, which aren't really seeing much change anymore in the technology, might have something more like an eight-year review clause. So that's something like circulators or maybe um, pumps. And what's not defined at the moment is how we review these, and um, the Commission has to present a review 
study at, le at the very least to the consultation forum after a set amount of time. And um, these review studies, they can be quite dynamic, really. Uh, they can be six months, they can be a year or two years. So far, there's been a number of processes which have taken from six to 36 months, um, although actually the, the study time was, was shorter. And then how that then goes into the review proposals is also very unclear, and, and so far that's also taken a range of months, and it's, it's quite unclear uh, how people progress with, with this, uh, or at least how the commission progresses sometimes with these review, review processes. But that actually then goes back into this feedback loop. So if we think now we have 29 uh, regulations in force, if you look at the next uh, 10 years, let's say, you start to see these review processes, they should start kind of uh, iteratively making the regulations better, bringing in more products and uh, enabling us to make more energy savings or address other aspects like material efficiency, for instance. Now these three steps, the preparatory study, the consultation forum, and the review study, are really key points where you can as a stakeholder bring in uh, inputs and uh, influence the regulation and make the study better, for instance. So when we were talking about maybe uh, bringing in learning curves or uh, different aspects in the least life cycle and cost analysis yesterday, this is where it actually probably has to happen unless it goes into the impact assessment, which is done without so much stakeholder input. Um, but when we were looking at preparatory studies in the BAM, um, we had a, a, a small workshop in, in 2014, and um, we, we noticed that there's a lot of challenges when you're making a new regulation, and particularly since we've moved away from mass-produced products towards things such as machine tools or windows or building insulation, it's becoming more and more difficult to set your system boundaries, to identify your scope, make definitions which fit for all of Europe, um, also to find data on an energy efficiency, um, there's maybe no energy efficiency measurement standards. Sometimes the products are custom made um, for different applications. Um, and there's overlapping policies. So it's, it's becoming a bit of a challenge to, to also make new ecodesign re regulations. So we, we kind of had a discussion on this, and there was a discussion paper on these different challenges, particularly for complex product groups. And the result of this, this workshop, uh, one of the outcomes was to sort of the, the question, OK, well, we have at least a standardized methodology for these uh, preparatory studies, but what's the context with reviews? Um, at the moment, the, the Commission's just been following a very ad hoc uh, approach. Just make sure that that review gets there in time for the consultation forum, essentially. Um, at least that's the way it comes across as a stakeholder. But there's actually a lot you can do with this review opportunity. Um, if you think about these preparatory studies, um, they're addressing often non-regulated um, product groups in the energy efficiency space. Stakeholders are very skeptical. They're not sure if they can meet the, the targets that are in these regulations. Um, so actually, your original regulations, they tend to represent a political compromise, which is a result of the dialogue that's had at, in the, in the consultation, consultation forum. But once you come back to revise this regulation three, four, five years later, you have a lot of stakeholders who've been involved with implementing these legislations, um, and they have intimate knowledge with, with the requirements that are in there. So actually, you have a really great opportunity to iron out all your loopholes, improve your definitions, and by doing so, really attack all of the, the products that haven't yet been kept in scope and, and make much more uh, important energy savings. You've got stakeholders who are actually interested in contributing their own uh, data to the process, um, there were 80 position papers, for example, in the FANS review. There were 30 in the Transformers review recently. So there's a lot of lot more discussion, and there's a really good opportunity to actually make something of this. Uh, so I think it's important that we actually use this review opportunity to, to boost energy savings and to address different aspects, because there is this much more engagement. And it shouldn't really be seen as just a quick update, and then we deal with it later. You also have networks which the consultants can rely on. and um, you can also bring in market surveillance authorities experience with this really difficult gray zone uh, areas where it's otherwise difficult to to bring products into scope or say you're definitely met by this regulation. So I've, I've touched on this a bit uh, in the last few sentences. Why are reviews important? Well, we can improve the energy savings by making a, a much better regulation in the first place. We can refine our definitions, um, get legal certainty and, and remove loopholes. We can rescale the labels, of course. 
you can extend the scope to, to new products, um, which of course then improves your, your energy savings overall. And you can start to increase your limits so that you, you cut off the least efficient uh, products from the market and can stimulate more innovation as well. And of course, a lot of the, qu the questions at the moment are around material efficiency. How can we also address material efficiency in our reviews, uh, particularly for the products which are uh, more energy efficient? Resource efficiency or material efficiency becomes much more relevant because it's a, a larger part of the environmental impact once your energy efficiency is improved. So I want to kind of discuss with you today, maybe we can discuss a bit later in the discussion groups as well, um, the idea of how we want to review things. Um, there is no prescribed process, and the commission is obviously the last person responsible for how we do these reviews, but um, you can start to ask a few questions. How long should a review actually be? Um, do we want it to be as fast as possible so we can get as many savings as quickly as possible? Like Peter was saying yesterday, we need to be quick. We only have 10 years before we reach our climate, uh, yeah, need to reach our, our climate targets. Or um, do we want to involve as many stakeholders as possible? Um, how much stakeholder interaction is necessary to actually reach a consensus and, and a good review? And we can also ask, well, how should inputs come into this process? Do we want to look at life cycle analysis and least cost analysis in every single review? Or do we want to just allow uh, assessment of material efficiency separately in a different study and, and that comes in and we talk about it a bit? So there's a lot of different options there, but uh, at the moment it's a bit ad hoc and, and the commission has, has so far done a, a range of different uh, study approaches. Um, in 2014, we had the, the first omnibus review, which looked at seven different product groups at once and um, tried to identify the review potentials in each one. Uh, in the end, it was decided to go ahead with uh, four MIRP format studies for products which needed more um, support in the review. And for one of them, they decided not to review it anymore. So that approach was at least useful in, in reducing the number of reviews by one. There was also the idea of a fast track review. In 2013, the study was published um, just to do a six months review on the ex um, external power supplies. And this was quite an interesting idea because um, there was a Department of Energy ruling um, on external power supplies, which had a lot of support, uh, I think a thousand page document behind it, which could be used as the basis for uh, aligning the European legislation. However, when it went into the study, another limit was added on top, which was more stringent for industry. And the fact that the study was so short and it wasn't supported by least life cycle cost analysis meant that you couldn't necessarily go ahead with a more stringent um, target, let's say, or a limit. Then there's the, also the standard methodology for the MIP. Um, this has been used in a number of the reviews, but it's actually a methodology which was made for new product regulation, and there's no kind of retrospective aspect to it. So we can ask, is this methodology still appropriate to use in this review context, or can we use some tasks and we need to think about what else we actually want to have in the review? Or you can just say, well, I have limited money, I have limited time, I want to review these main problems in the legislation, and then you focus on these, these specific aspects, which is also an approach the Commission has taken in a number of aspect, um, product groups. So there, are a, there is a, a certain amount of flexibility, and I think it's, it's really important at the beginning of these studies maybe to, uh, to ask what do we want to actually have in there? What's needed before we can actually get to a stakeholder consensus at the end? Do we want to have a least life cycle cost analysis? Do we want to have a, a life cycle analysis? How has the technology changed? And, and these are maybe also questions which can be turned on the head and, and say, well, if we want to move to a much faster review process overall, what are the completely new approaches maybe we can discuss later, which would actually, within the, the regulatory process of eco-design, also bring about change a bit faster. So as I said, this, this research was done at the end of 2015. At, at that time, we only had um, uh, seven review processes uh, on, on their way. Um, so this slide I originally had done in 2015, um, we had the televisions review. This started in 2012, and there was an up updated study in 2014. It just looked at specific aspects and didn't include a life cycle analysis, didn't include the least life cycle cost 
Uh, some of that was done in the impact assessment, which came after. Then you had the fast track review process, which was trialed for external power supplies. That wasn't accepted by stakeholders, which then led to a longer process overall, and they had to update the data because it wasn't able to move forward. So you ended up having an extended and longer process overall. Um, and an update was brought to the consultation forum in 2015. Then there was the omnibus review, which looked at um, about seven different product groups. And um, based on that, there were then follow-up review processes following the MIP. One of those had already gone to consultation forum at the end of 2015. And then for fans, there was a specific aspects review, which looked at uh, over 10 months, different aspects within um, the fans regulation. That seemed to reach some sort of agreement in the consultation forum. And all of these were kind of going into their next regulatory steps. And it's now 2018. And uh, we can look back at all of these product groups and sort of ask how far have they gotten then in this review process. Some of them were actually finished. Um, well, none of them have made it to changes in the, any of the, the legislation. And this is largely due to a kind of pol political blockade, uh, which happened in the EU Commission for about a year and a half, I believe. Um, and we see the, the impact of this. Uh, every time that you have to delay for political reasons or, or other reasons, you have to do another update on your data. You have to do another um, consultation forum. And uh, in, the, in the case of televisions, we've had a, a couple more updates. And um, behind the scenes, there's been impact assessments which have been taking place. Um, but for each of the industry stakeholders, for instance, that's, that's a problem because they have to keep supplying data, keep attending. All of these open review processes don't go away. Uh, external power supplies hasn't moved forward. For the MIP studies, they've been finished, and they went to consultation forum in December last year. And FANS is also kind of waiting on this political process. And this would be OK, but uh, I mean, it, it wouldn't be ideal, of course, because we want to actually achieve something with these review processes. Um, but that was to 2015. And if you think, well, um, each of these reviews, which was also queuing up behind, they have also entered the process now. So we now have another eight review processes, which are all open and simultaneously running in parallel. and. Um, this is a bit of a challenge for stakeholders trying to follow the process. And add to that the fact that there's also new products being regulated at the same time. And there's a lot going on. So I tried to look at some of the challenges which were affecting these review studies. Um, they have two to three times less budget than your original preparatory study. They have less time. So they actually have to prioritize on the aspects that should be reviewed. Um, data analysis is also a bit of an issue. Um, Due to these resource problems, they aren't able to necessarily go out and collect new data. So it's sometimes a bit of a rehash of data that's already existing. Or you have to depend on industry or external sources, which can also maybe be biased. Um, we discussed yesterday the issue of um, real world use data is completely missing. And it's something that needs to come in a lot more into these regulations, particularly in the review phase, because if your testing standards don't match up with um, uh, your legislation, then actually you, you're not achieving the energy efficiency savings that you were expecting. Um, and as a result of this, these measurement standards have actually become central to the discussion in the review process. The discussion has become much more technical. Um, and a lot of the questions are about, okay, well, what do we need to do to change our standards to also improve our legislation? And, and, and there's, <coughs> there needs to be a much more, or there is a much more uh, intertwining between these standards for testing energy efficiency and, and also this review process itself and, and how you actually get to these um, energy savings following a review. And some of the review clauses were a bit tight, so the poor consultants had to try and review something which had been in force for a few months, maybe, uh, going to one year, which is obviously also difficult. Uh, manufacturers are getting used to this new regulation. Um, the data is constantly changing, and, and by the end of the year, you've got a, a kind of changing data set which you try to analyze. And whenever we make new legislation, we should definitely make, try to make sure that the review clause doesn't come, you know, one year after the entry into force of the first tier, or at least a little bit longer, so you can deal with that. 
as I already mentioned, there's long delays and that makes data invalid. And then you have to update each of these reviews. So everyone's got a lot of open files. And lastly, um, material efficiency is difficult to incorporate because there's no real methodology for that. There is the MEP, but it's, it's using a streamlined lifecycle analysis. So just to hone into one of these um, review processes, we have the displays review. Uh, as I said, that already had uh, three kind of updates to the data over the last six years. It was supposedly supposed to be reviewed in 2012, but uh, we're now in 2018 and it still hasn't uh, changed the legislation. That's quite a while. Um, in 2014, um, uh, a number of new material efficiency requirements were proposed in the legislation. These were quite contentious because um, they weren't backed by standards, which meant that they would be enforceable. And uh, some things like a recyclability index were in there, which were very contentious for stakeholders. Um, so based on that, that then had to go back into a, a lot of kind of feedback loops to try to, to move the, the review forward. And the other contentious point in, in 2014 was that actually we wanted to rescale the label in a specific way, but this was all dependent on the fact that the EU labeling directive was in revision and wasn't overhauled until last summer. Um, so before this framework was, was there, it was difficult to actually review what was, what was happening in, in the displays um, regulation. And furthermore, you didn't have, it was, it was looking at specific aspects, but they didn't really look at the life cycle analysis. They didn't do a li least life cycle cost analysis in the televisions product group. That's okay, because as we heard yesterday, uh, least life cycle cost um, is independent of price for a lot of ICT products. So maybe it's not something that always needs to be in the review. Uh, but if you look at the technology of televisions compared to when the first uh, preparatory study was done in 2007, we've changed from CRT and LCD televisions to LED televisions. And that's actually not the same technology, and that means your LCA isn't really valid anymore. So where there were an, um, analyzers of these uh, life cycle analysis points, that tended to happen in external inputs from the Joint Research Center of the, the Commission or in the eco-label update. And um, for stakeholders, it's not always clear where these material efficiency requirements come from. And this is a question of you know, asking, do we want to look at these material efficiency aspects in the review study itself, or does it need to be a parallel study? Or how do you increase the dialogue and increase this, the exchange on, on these aspects? There's also the question of extending scope to products which weren't in the original legislation. And if you have a, a quite brief review study, it's very difficult to do that um, and say that there won't be any impacts on the producers of that uh, product. For example, signage displays, they may have different characteristics to televisions. Uh, they may be used in a different use case. So it's very difficult to say without doing a large MIRP study that you can extend scope in, in that way without having any adverse effects on the market. So to do that, you need to have consensus which is then difficult without the data. So we'll discuss this a bit later, but um, we can ask ourselves, or well, how can reviews actually um, approach material efficiency? Um, so far, we had some inputs on material efficiency in the computers product review, on the, um, the televisions as well, but it was always supporting studies and not necessarily in, in focus of the review study itself. Is this something that we want to standardize for all reviews or is it something that we can address horizontally? Um, in any case, a number of stakeholders aren't ready to go ahead without standards to make it um, enforceable. You really need to focus on the things which are currently possible to enforce for market surveillance authorities. And that normally requires some sort of measurement standard, which makes it difficult. Different LCA sets give different um, results. Some stakeholders would argue that eco-design methodology is very much biased towards energy use and uh, not towards the production phase. And there's an example here of a UPA study, uh, the German uh, Environment Office, which did a study in 2012. And using the eco-design data set, they um, found that the global warming potential was only 35% of um, the to uh, sorry, the global warming potential of the production accounted for 35% of the total impacts. 
and using three other data sets for the um, eco uh, for the LCA, they, they found that actually these said that 56% of the uh, impacts would come from the production phase. So it's again, it's a contentious point, and it's something where having a, an overall methodology on resource efficiency or material efficiency would be quite useful. Some might say, okay, well, actually, the commission tried to, to look at material efficiency aspects. There was a extension to the life cycle analysis uh, indicators in 2013 or 14, I think, where recyclability, recycled content, lifetime, and critical raw material index came in. But at the same time, I really don't think that this is deep enough to, to deal with resource efficiency questions in, in the way that a lot of people would like to uh, and in the depth that's necessary. So that given everything I've shown, I hope that that has given a good overview of, um, of the review processes so far. We can ask ourselves a few questions. Is it necessary to standardize this review process or is it fine to kind of just pick and go as, as we, we can uh, with the limited resources that there are? Um, or maybe it would be useful to have a methodology, at least at the, the beginning of the review, to decide, okay, well, do we need a life cycle ana analysis? Do we need least life cycle cost analysis? Are there other aspects which need to be brought in? And I think for things like learning curves or um, some of the other ideas yesterday, that could be an interesting thing to, uh, to consider, whether they should become a standard aspect to, con uh, to look at in each product group. Scope extension is difficult if you aren't going to supply a complete market analysis with that. Um, and it will be difficult to find consensus when it's not there. And the MIRP was designed for new products. Do we maybe need to look at ways to make that more res retrospective, more evaluative of these past regulations, or is it OK as it is? Um, and of course, a, a resource methodology framework would be quite useful to bring all stakeholders up to the same level when we're having these resource discussions. So finally, uh, just to sum up a bit, um, the review process is actually a very important uh, opportunity if there are delays, okay, maybe it's not as bad as if you're delaying on a, on a new product group because there is at least some form of regulation there. But as you can see, it's really been dragging on a lot now, and, and that's uh, made it difficult for stakeholders to follow, and it's, it's not ideal, that's for sure. But the approach so far could be argued to be appropriate because there are limited time and, and resource constraints in the commission. When you're starting a study, if you look at the fast track uh, situation, you really need to get stakeholder um, agreement and acceptance on the plan methodology when you're going ahead. If that's there, I think that these fast track ideas can actually work, but there needs to be agreement on what needs to be in the study at the beginning. Otherwise, it will lead to a much longer process overall where you have to update the study, commission new ones, and maybe then it takes two or three years instead of the planned six months. Um, if you're looking at scope extension, maybe this is a, an idea to combine it with the next working plan for the commission. Um, you could look at the um, omnibus style review as a way of d identifying review potentials. Where there are gaps in scope, these could then maybe be addressed in a new um, MIP study, a mini MIP maybe, just looking at, at smaller parts of the, of the product group. Set review deadlines which aren't too um, uh, short, let's say after entry into force. And um, as standards have become so central to this process, it would be good to, to really enable a bit more dialogue. I think Chris mentioned yesterday um, institutionalizing the dialogue between stakeholders and uh, um, standards organizations so that you can actually progress a bit faster within these, these groups. Um, so that's uh, a bit of an insight <coughs> and an overview. I hope uh, it wasn't too many processes all at once, but um, if you want to read a bit more into that analysis, there was uh, a paper that was published uh, last year. You can take a look. Thank you. Okay, questions? Well, we start here simply because you're close. <coughs> okay, <coughs> thank you. Bozdar Pavlovic, Ministry of Economy of Montenegro. I actually we are aware that certain pieces of this eco-design regulation actually are amended now. This is, is not working, okay? So amended in the previous period, specifically for the lighting and also for the lighting circulators. So my question actually is this. 
uh, amendments are the process uh, are results of some review process or this is a result of some other process if you have can clarify to me thank you so I think for lighting uh, specifically, there was the stage six review. Um, that was something which uh, was already kind of decided upon as a separate review process just to, to deal with one aspect of the legislation. And at the moment, um, there is an idea or based on the, the long review study that was done on, on light sources, the idea was to bring all of the lighting regulations together. and. If that then is accepted, uh, I'm not sure what the, cu the current status is on the lighting, but um, I think there was a consultation forum in December where they're looking at bringing, I think there are four uh, different regulations on lighting and they, they need to be brought together. And, and that's the result of this uh, light sources review study. Yeah. Uh, th thank you for the presentation. Sorry for the long introduction. My name is George Paunescu from DG Energy, the eco design unit, uh, eco design team within the energy efficiency unit. Um, yeah, I have loads of, of comments actually, uh, and some clarifications. Uh, this is uh, uh, first of all. Let me say that it's 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 very interesting, very uh, informative to to have this discussion. To thank again to the organizers, and see uh, all these bright bright minds uh, trying to to help the process and improve it, and that expresses support for the policy that we are doing and reassurance that it's effective. Um, coming back to the presentation, um, the eco-design process, uh, indeed, now the baseline uh, calculation for us is around 48 months. Uh, I heard other numbers yesterday, but that, that's it. And um, broadly speaking, half of it is the pre preparatory or revision study, uh, so the technical work, and, and half of it is the, the the uh, regulatory work, all the steps that we are bound to, uh, which are many. And uh, okay, Th uh, there was here a, um, a flow chart. It's it's much more <laughs> elaborated than that. I'm afraid. I have my Gantt charts, and I can count more than thirty something steps for 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 them. Uh, never mind. Um, yeah, we are working to to uh, keep them under control and uh, many of them they have very uh, clear deadlines uh, it's a it's a clearly scheduled process in in our unit kept under control at least from the from the scheduling side but then there are a lot of uh, uncertainties that could arise in, in the process and I will I will number them later um, it's all based on the work program. So now we are in the third, I think, work program. And these sort of omnibus uh, review, uh, as you call it, I think, it's it's a special, uh, it's, it's not, yeah, it's just a screening process to see what we put in the working plan. And then based on the working plan, we start uh, counting our way uh, back and, and backwards and then in the future to see how can we we schedule all these uh, files but um, the uh, revision study the methodology that uh, was mentioned I, I would argue that uh, the MERP I don't okay yeah. Uh, the MERP, I think it's it's fit for purpose. It's it's good for, uh, it stands as it is for, for the revision study. I would say that it's particularly challenging for uh, more horizontal regulations. For instance, one of my files is on standby, network standby. And then there is really uh, challenging to apply uh, MERP to the letter. Because there are, there, are there are so many different products which are Okay, hopefully this works better. So I would say it's good. Uh, there are other limitations. And uh, for the review studies, uh, so the, the methodology is set. What is less clear is the timing, which tends to vary from one product to another, depending on how complex we think that the, the revision would be. So it, 
when we are launching the, the studies with, with our consultants, we set them, so the timeline is set, but it could vary, 12 months, 16 months, 18 months, uh, depends on. So that, that's a judgment on a, on a case by case, but I would say that's the, the, the uncertainty at that point. And then uh, there are other uncertainties that emerge in the process, and they were given here examples. Uh, indeed, the, the televisions is one of the most complicated, and uh, the, the technology changed so fast during the study, so in, in I think, two waves or already, uh, talking to the colleague, uh, to my colleague, which deals with this product. So it was the move from CRT to LCD, and now we have a rapid uh, change in the LCDs with HDR, 4K, and so on. So it's, it's hard to, to keep up with, with the technology development. And one is the, uh, this is one of the challenges that we are facing in that it was pointed out here. Uh, shorter and shorter uh, product development cycles and technological cycles versus longer uh, policy cycles, 48, uh, 48 months. And uh, this is one of the things we are trying to investigate to see if we can uh, find other ways, alternative ways to, to deal with this. And I, I, I heard uh, interesting uh, uh, examples here, the uh, presentation of yesterday from Hans Paul uh, on moving away from the least life cycle cost and trying something which could, uh, could work faster. Uh, that's something that we are trying to do. And this year, we'll have a, a study uh, focusing on ICT and uh, looking uh, at uh, the sector in, in general. Uh, what are the savings potential? What are the implications? Uh, are there un any other ways of doing or improving uh, eco design or uh, using it in, in, a, in a different way? And I'm sure that some of the conclusions of today would be very interesting for, for us. Uh, okay, this is one uh, challenge. Another challenge was, well, it was mentioned a, a bit of a political uncertainty. Uh, hopefully that was gone and will not come back. But sometimes the stars align in a, in a sort of a bad way and these things are coming together. The, the EPS was an example. So uh, it was started on something and then uh, the fast track was not uh, suitable. That's the lessons learned for, for us, of course, for everybody's a learning curve, and this is factored in, into uh, the process now. But then we, we hit this sort of political block, and then, uh, yeah, it uh, slipped from there. But that's uh, one of the things which is, uh, uh, will is ongoing now. Um, and, uh, yeah, another challenge are the new topics which are brought on board. And I would say as, as a personal opinion, I think uh, eco design from, from some point of view, it's, it's a victim of its own success because we are hearing this from even from other uh, colleagues in the commission, other directorates. They want to do everything through eco design because they know it works. So, <laughs> uh, and again, uh, th these are sort of contradicting objectives. On the one hand, we want to make everything leaner and, and faster. On the other hand, of course, we need to, to look at um, a circular economy, but uh, uh, as it was said, it sometimes raises uh, a lot of debate because there are no standards, uh, the metrics are missing largely, and so on. We did some uh, some of these aspects in the past, like durability criteria for vacuum cleaners, uh, for 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 light appliances, uh, but they were focused on little parts. Now it seems that we are expanding on circular economy, talking in general the durability of a very complex product like a washing machine and so on. So again, this is a this is a thing that that will evolve. It, it doesn't come overnight, but there's a. Um, um, standardization mandate ongoing uh, in Sen and Senelec to look at these aspects. It's quite complex. They have many deliverables looking at durability, reparability, uh, upgradability, and so on, and started actually with a standard which lays down the, the, the definitions. So the <laughs> that's very good. And uh, just to say that the MERP, the methodology, uh, is intended to be revised this year, I think. They will start our colleagues from DigiGrow. And yeah, uh, we'll look at how can we improve it. And circular economy is one of the things which will be in there. So uh, thank you.
just just to say that yeah we do scheduling we do try to keep things under control some of them uh, are out of our reach uh, some of them are lessons learned already and in the past were sort of out of, of our reach now are within the reach I would say uh, yeah and uh, an important point regarding the input uh, the availability and quality of data is, is essential in the studies. Uh, and it varies. In, in, in one of the studies that were on my files, it was so much sort of availability from the industry to uh, give us data again and again. At, at some point, I needed to just to draw the line and set a cutoff date, because otherwise we don't end the study. We keep collecting data. Uh, so, uh, but that, that's very important to have the data, and it's it's indeed in the uh, in the review process or the the preparatory study. But sometimes uh, now, especially when we are picking up with with older files, uh, we will need to collect again some data in the impact assessment uh, phase. And this is a very it it was important, but now I would say it's it's uh, extremely important to have a good impact assessment to. Uh, withstand all the tight, very tight scrutiny uh, internal in the commission. Thank you. Uh, Lancelot Triano from South Africa again. At the uh, maybe commission stage, I'm, I'm talking about uh, the political compromise. Do you keep any track at all of the cost of the political compromises or blockages that may arise from time to time? Uh, I think that's a question for the commission, maybe, not for me. Maybe I uh, can answer that. Uh, I did some, uh, some calculations uh, on the cost of the delay or the, the, the missed energy savings of the delay in, in my PhD, and they can be considerable. Uh, but of course, all of this is, is a, as was said, is a political process uh, in, in the end. And uh, I very much doubt whether uh, by, say, by making things more stricter, uh, you can shorten the time or uh, have shortcuts in your study or whatever. But uh, that would be uh, maybe apart from the resource efficiency discussion, uh, uh, good topics for the discussion this afternoon, because I think there's a lot more to say. Uh, about this and also how to, well, keep it on the ground and, and workable. Final reply? Uh, yeah, I would just come, come back in and say I didn't want to paint the commission in a negative light with, the, with this presentation. I, I definitely um, think that they, they're taking a, a, a good route based on the external constraints that, that are there, and, and a lot of those are political and outside the control of, of the commission's uh, eco-design team. Um, and yeah, a, a lot of the conclusions that I drew are yeah actually that this approach that's been taken so far has been uh, adequate um, based on on the constraints that are there. So it's or it's, it's an appropriate approach, and I, I'm happy to hear that the commission is actually also developing new ideas as well. And eco design has always been a learning process, so it's nice to see that as well in the reviews. Yeah, and um, thank you. <laughs>